Hi, I'm Nancy Brinker, and I welcome you to my program, Conversations With. And today, I have a really wonderful uh, friend and a woman I admire very much uh, for us all to talk to and learn from, Anne Romney. I know many of you know Anne, and I'm so welcome and welcome you oh, and, thank in you. your home <laughs> to talk to you. And Anne, I'm just thrilled you could be with us today. And I want to disclose right away that I think I'm one of your biggest fans, and I supported you, and I supported your husband in all of his campaigns, and I so I have to disclose that because uh, I, I, I'm very fond of you. And <laughs> well, it's mutual, so thank you, Nancy. Thank you. And I think that you are an amazing woman, and there is so much that I want our audience, our friends, partners to listen to today and to hear about you because I was reading your Wikipedia. And I thought, my gosh, it's thick. And it went on for a long time. And so <laughs> I direct anyone there. But what are you doing now? What are you, what are you doing now? Well, what do you love the my most? My passion now, my grandchildren, my husband. Um, of course, my husband. Wait, I should redo that. My husband, my grandchildren. <laughs> <laughs> um, my horses, which you see here. And then, of course, my, the Ann Romney Center for Neurologic Disease. And my passion for the advancement of neuroscience, and especially with women's brains. We might touch on that today. Yeah, I think so. I think it's very fascinating in the conversation we've had, um, what you've learned in your journey. And you have had an amazing journey in your life. I, I will say that. I honestly didn't know all the things that you've done. But it started out, and you, you grew up in Michigan. Right. You met in 1965. You grew up in Michigan. And then, and then how did all that go? Because you were separated for quite a while right. before you so married. Right. So we met in high school. I was a sophomore, spring of my so March, actually. March 21st was our first date of 1969. And um, I'm, I'm sorry, 65, because we got married on March 21st of 1969. And then um, Mitt was a senior, and he went off to Stanford. And then from Stanford, he went off for two and a half years to France. And so this was like, talk about a long-distance romance for three and a half years when I was so young. He was my first love. So he comes home, and then you marry very quickly. Right. Well, and it was shocking because we hadn't seen each other for quite a long time. And I'm thinking, I mean, I'm young at this point now. I'm 19. I'm not that young anymore. But I'm, I'm like, yeah, I don't even know how I feel about this guy. I'm not sure. I haven't seen him for so long. I don't know how this is going to work. And we saw each other. He ran past, his mother still hasn't got, never got over this, ran past his parents, ran past everybody, grabbed me and just hugged me. <laughs> and it was like, Time dissolved, and we were right back to where we were before he left. In the car ride home, it was one of those uh, three passenger, three level station wagons where the back seat faced out, <laughs> and it was one of those old woodies. We were sitting in the very back, and by the time we got home from the airport in Detroit to Michigan, you know, to our home, it was like an hour drive. We were announcing to everybody that we were getting married. Oh, fabulous! <laughs> and that means that did not go over well with anybody. <laughs> And now you have well, now you have 24 grandchildren, but the five boys, that happened in pretty fast order. Didn't well, it? 13 I mean, years. Uh -huh. um, I'm, tag was okay. So our first date, March 21st, 1965. We got married March 21st, 1969. <laughs> our first son was born March 21st, 1970. Oh my gosh! And then um, son two came 18 months later. And then you know, but but then we we I stretched it out like three years, three years, and so then you know the other three came along. Um, but they, we were in Boston and um, loving, loving life and having this great, this great time. And you are extremely, and then in all this, you've had an extremely good education. You made sure that, or your parents, my, or... My father made me promise if I married, I mean, I, this was the final argument. He's like, look, you, you cannot get married this young. You're not going to finish, finish your education or whatever. I promised him I would finish my education. I remember very well when you were, when Mitt was governor and you were first lady and all the things you did, the health care plan that you developed. And yet it wasn't all easy. Um, you started to have some hardships then uh, with, your, with your health. Well, you know, I, um, I, my, my health became a very significant thing in our lives. And um, I was diagnosed, actually, in 1999. Oh way before Mitt was even governor, but it was um, a defining moment uh -huh. for both Mitt and myself because we knew that life was never going to be the same again and that everything that we were going to decide or not decide to do was going to de be determinant on my, my personal health. So I was very, very sick. Um, 
when I was diagnosed. And I will tell you, when Mitt was with me, <clears throat> um, with the doctor, when I had the diagnosis, I was relieved in some level to know I had a name for what was going on because I was so confused. Um, and then at the same time, I'm like, my life is over. This is it. My life is over. And, and um, the doctor stepped out, gave us a moment, and Mitt just came over to me, grabbed me, and he said, Anne, we are in this together. Oh. And that is the title of my book that I wrote, which is In This Together. And to know that he was my sweetheart and my wonderful friend and my husband and my partner and everything, we are in this together. Yeah. And he was amazing. And, you know, and he's like, I don't care if you never cook another dinner. I can eat peanut butter sandwiches for my life. I don't care. Don't worry about it. I don't care if you're in a wheelchair. I don't care. As long as we're together, we're okay. I think the, the, your story is so amazing because not only, I'm sorry, I just get emotional, but not only was he there for you um, in that way, but, but that must have helped you then live with this. And, and I won't say the word recover, but you have such a useful functional life today. And, 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 and that was probably the seed in your mind for not feeling defeated. Well, you know, I, I really did think my life was over. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I can't sugarcoat how bad I was mm -hmm. or how ill I was. And you were numb and you I, were Well, I'd lost the use of and... my right leg. Oh. I was numb all the way up to here. I was using, losing my right arm. I, I, but it wasn't even that that was so bad. I could do that. It was the fatigue, the unrelenting fatigue that never went away, never, never went away. And you'd think, well, tomorrow I'll wake up and I'll feel better. No, nothing helped, nothing helped. And I couldn't even get out of bed. I mean, I had not the energy. I try to explain to people, I would see a pile of mail and I wouldn't have the energy to open an envelope. And it took me about a year to go from being that ill to going to the place where I'm like, I got to take charge of this myself mm -hmm. now mm -hmm. because nothing else is working and there's no answers for me. I got to find them myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> I think that at that point, it was very helpful for me as well, where he was like, you're, you're okay mm -hmm. and we're okay. And I could accept that I was really ill. For the longest time, I, I wouldn't mm -hmm. believe it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And then you um, went through the the uh, term of office as you know first lady, yeah. Um, and and then later on you you had another bout with a very serious disease. Well, I did, and you're familiar with that yeah. because I was diagnosed with breast cancer. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've learned the hard way of how you have to start being your your advocate for yourself. I had nothing that I thought was ever going to be worth living for again, mm -hmm. and. Um, and I came through that, and I wanted, I wanted people to know that, you know, you can pull through. I like to tell people, you've got to find, where is it, what is it in life that gives you joy? Right. Yeah. Find your joy. Mm -hmm. Go there. Keep yeah. going there. Yeah. Keep going back there. Because, you know, you, 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 I think we're meant to be joyful. Right. I, I don't think we're meant to be, this is, can't be all just hard. But what was the moment... When you got on the horse, was that the moment you said, wow, well, you know, I found it, my joy again? Yeah, it's true. I mean, I didn't, and I was on the shaggy old thing, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that could barely trot, but I didn't care. Yeah. It was, um, you, you just put your leg, you know what it's yeah, like because you're sure. a rider. You put your yeah. leg over that saddle, yeah. the world dissolves. Yeah. And then, you, then I would get off and I'd be like really energetic and feeling good. And I, it, it took me a while to figure out what, like, oh my gosh, yeah. I feel okay for like an hour maybe after I ride. I had energy again. During the process of figuring it out, as Ann puts it, she had a revelation on what would be next for her and her family. We'll have more when we return. Deeply divided country. Very deeply divided and, country. And I think all of us are concerned about that. But we need to learn to respect one another mm -hmm. and listen to one another. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if one side wins and the other side loses, which is, you know, the Republicans, Democrats, whatever, it, however you want to divide it, blue states, red states, we are one nation. Right. And we are one nation under God. And we have to remember 
that we have to respect one another and be kinder and nice. I mean, just just be kinder. It must have been hurtful. It must have been hurtful to you, and and particularly in this last campaign with the level of dialogue, the loud, the loud speaking, the the mm -hmm. words, the labels. I mean, right. how was that? Well, you for always, you? you know, it's it's always tough. I remember my first political experience with negative um, reporting yeah. was at the '94 race yeah. when we ran against Ted Kennedy. It was amazing to me that the press would actually they would distort things so incredibly to write, represent my husband in a way that was not who he was. They did it for me as well, which was like, what? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, what? I, what are you yeah. doing? Yeah. And I was shocked by that. And then, then it's like, okay, guess what? You're not just running against the opposition, you're running against the press too. Right. And and you know, there's obviously can be friendly press or non-friendly press, but if they decide they want to paint you a certain way, they're gonna they've got a narrative and they're gonna they're gonna put you in that box and that narrative. And I learned early on um, to just recognize that if you're in that game, that's the game you're gonna have to play. Mm -hmm. I understand why a lot of people don't want to put themselves through that. Well, you you certainly did, and not just once, but <clears throat> but twice in mm -hmm. the presidential, and then I, I, people wanted you to run again. Right. I think every, the nation was was wide awake watching uh, the governor Mitt sitting and having dinner with Donald Trump. Right. And I can only imagine, I, I, I can only I can't imagine what was going through your mind, and and everybody was riveted, and and many many people wanted him to be the choice. Right. Many people understood there were other people who, the, the it didn't rest with us. Right. At that point, it was out of everyone else's hands. It was the hands of the president. How did you? How did you feel after that, and how, how did he feel? Well, you know, um, frankly, we were very pleased that he would reach to us and consider Mitt. I thought that was a very mm -hmm. wonderful sign. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, George yeah. Bush even called us and said, hey, yeah. I, I, I think that's great. Yeah, you know, exactly. I, I might have a different opinion of him right now because of that. So I think that was, that was magnanimous of him to do that. I think they had an extraordinary dialogue and had a deeper appreciation for each other and a deeper understanding. And I think now this president knows like what's on the line. It was all a very positive and a good thing. Mm -hmm. It was not, I think they got along well. Mitt really does like forgive and forget very quickly. So, I mean, he's, I have five sons and I'm, I'm always like astonished by that. They taught me <laughs> a lot. Let me just tell you from a woman's perspective, having five boys that would like really Is dust it up <laughs> and like, like almost be killing each other. And then I look around and they're like, okay, it's over. That taught me so much about like, let's, you know, let's face it. Let's get it over with. Let's talk about it and let's move on. It's so, and, and, and you're right. That's so true. Now, <clears throat> did you ever in all this time when you were having children want a girl? I was just oh, curious about that. Oh, are you kidding? That. And those were the days when you the, didn't know. You didn't know. So. <laughs> you didn't know. And, you know, and even with my fifth baby, he was, um, we had we were doing ultrasounds, but the ultrasounds weren't really clear yeah, sometimes, uh -huh. mm -hmm. so you didn't know. And and when that fifth boy came out, I'm like, <laughs> you it. are kidding me. <laughs> <laughs> and then I turned him in. I'm like, that's it. <laughs> that's it. We'll keep going. We're going to have a big team here. And, we're and, <laughs> and so now with the 24 grandkids, yeah, <clears throat> 17 of them are boys. Oh my gosh! And how I, you? <laughs> I, know, I, I have no sisters. I had no daughters. But my granddaughters are the coolest things in the oh, world. I have seven granddaughters. Isn't that <clears> wonderful? <throat> well, now, and, and so this is another question. With that many grand, how do you remember all their names? How do you remember People their are, birthdays? People are shocked by that. It's like it's like they are my own children. Mm -hmm. I know them that well. Mm -hmm. uh, my oldest granddaughter is 21. She's a friend. My next oldest um, grandkids are 17, or 16. They're 16 and a half. They're like friends. I know them so well. We travel with them. We vacation with them. We take them places. We take them on our own trips. We take them ourselves. And we know them so well. And we know them from the time they're newborn babies. I mean, you hold them when they're first born. They're my babies. That's I mean, and I always tell people, skip the parenting stage. <laughs> Go straight to being a grandparent. It's way better. It is. I know. <clears throat> it's way better. But I know each one of them. I love and adore each one of them. And I think they... They feel the same way about 
myself and about Mitt. I think they absolutely love you both. Love us. Love us. Do you did you have you taught <clears throat> them how to cook? Because your cookbook, yes. as I told you, is in my kitchen and I love it. It's the most one of the most useful books I've Would ever you, had. <laughs> what I loved this last Thanksgiving when I was cooking is that my grandson Wyatt, who is like eleven, came in the in the kitchen with a couple of my granddaughters. Good for you. <laughs> and I'm like, Wyatt, okay. We're gonna roll out this, and we, he 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 showed. He, I taught him how to make homemade rolls. Oh, isn't that wonderful? And Good you know, for you. you know what? Boys actually really do love to like make a mess mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. mix things up mm -hmm. and get dirty in the kitchen and do those things. And then they're like, "Wow, look what I made!" Um, so you know, get those boys in the kitchen. <clears throat> my 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 sons know how to cook. Yeah. Isn't that great? It's great. Wow. Up next, a moment of revelation for Anne and how it's given her life new meaning. But how exciting uh, now in your life that you've been able to turn this then into something. Uh, is, this, is this the next phase of yes. Anne Romney's this life? Is, this is my next phase and I love it. So um, I was going in for my annual um, physical with my doctor, mm -hmm. with, with my MS doctor, because he tracks me. I'm on a, I'm in I'm actually a Harvard Medical School study and you know, I have an, a brain MRI. I make sure my brain's still there. <laughs> Everything's sure working. <laughs> um, but I, I'm in this study, and so I'm in my visit, and it's about it's about a few months after Mitt's lost, and you know we're all sad about it, and um, and Dr. Howard Weiner, and I, I turned to him at one point, and I said, you know what, what a shame that Mitt lost, not just for the country, but for the sake of what I know you're doing with MS research, because as first lady, I could have had sure. a real impact. Sure with what's going on neurologically. And, he, and then I turned to him and I said, what the heck? It won't be as big, but let's still do something. Let's do something. And, and he said, well, you know, that's kind of curious, but my research in MS has, I've unlocked some secrets with Alzheimer's. Wow. And then after talking with him a few more minutes, I'm like, are you kidding? This is unbelievable. Wow. Then he said, well, you know, ALS too, we're kind of unlocking some things. And then he went in Parkinson's. I'm like, oh my gosh, gosh, we have to help you. This is unbelievable. So it took a few months and we put together this proposal. And my, where I was coming from is that I wanted to break down the silos and break down the barriers. And I wanted to have a, 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 a study of disease across diseases, but across, you know, collaborations yeah. mm -hmm. so that we weren't working in just silos in these diseases. So now the Ann Romney Center studies multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer's, ALS, Parkinson's, and brain tumors. It's like a hybrid academic environment yeah, it's, because you're so close to the science. It's unbelievable. Yeah. So when we, mm -hmm. Mitt and I were there for the opening um, and I'm going down and I'm introducing myself to a lot of these researchers. We have 250 researchers at the center. Wow. There's one aisle that's all research and then there's this glass partition wall where it's separated from their labs so that it can be sterile and mm -hmm. everything. But all of these researchers now are talking to each other. This They're all talking across disease great. platforms. Mm -hmm. They're all working and they're, you know, they're working from their computer labs and, and then going into the lab lab itself and it's all just open. But as we're just walking down the aisle and I'm talking, I'm like, oh, where are you from? China? Oh, PhD in what? Molecular biology? Oh, interesting. Oh, where are you from? Russia? Where are you from? Sweden? It's amazing. And, and it's amazing mm -hmm. that people have to understand that we are on the brink of an explosion of, with advancements. Yeah, yeah. And this is the new frontier, is neuroscience right. and the study right. of the brain. Right. And the thing I have learned, which is upsetting to me, is Women are much more susceptible mm -hmm. to Alzheimer's. They get it at a much higher frequency than men. Women are more susceptible to multiple sclerosis. Mm -hmm. Men, more susceptible to Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. So there is something happening mm -hmm. between a male brain and a female brain mm -hmm. where we have to now, and this is what we're doing at the center mm -hmm. too, separate some of the testing where if the blood work is was just patient A, now it's female patient A, male mm -hmm. patient A, that the, we're, we're, mm -hmm. we're gonna start sure. separating that and Gender. start figuring out okay. why, mm -hmm. what's going on? Why is the woman's brain more susceptible to, to Alzheimer's? 
Is it, it an you, autoimmune? It, it, we think it's a lot to do with uh, hormones, you know, or perhaps. Or well, estrogen. that's the easy, uh -huh. easy. That's the easy answer. Uh -huh. It'll have a piece that mm -hmm. they believe mm -hmm. that is a piece of it, but mm -hmm. not all of it. Yeah. Not all of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the next part of your life, you hope, will be building this center and educating people. And in fact. It's really a global problem. It's not just a problem in, yeah. in the U.S. Well, you know, 50 million people worldwide are affected by neurologic disease. Mm -hmm. And if you multiply that by family members, caretakers, everything else, it's, it's huge um, how many people are impacted. Mm -hmm. And as we're aging in this country, um, all of us are worried about our brain health mm -hmm. and our deterioration mm -hmm. and our mental acuity. And, you know, it's like, this is pretty, this is a pretty important that we do this. I will tell you in the center we're working on amazing drugs. Uh, we're working on a nasal vaccine mm -hmm. for Alzheimer's. Wow. We're working on a first-time drug for ALS. Both of these are going to be in human trials very shortly. We're I've already appealing to the FDA right now for approval for human trials. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, things are happening out there. And again, I, I, I'm saying it's the new frontier. But the fact is we have a lot of people in this country to take care of now and a health plan that seems not to be working for everyone. Right. And it, we have to figure out ways to be, as you, as you pointed to, more, more prevention oriented. Well, and, and you're coming from my perspective yeah. too, and you know, this is what I care about too, is that you don't, you don't, you're not, your insurance is not gonna depend on a pre-existing pre condition. Exactly. I mean, you know, you, you, we've, gotta, we've gotta somehow figure out how to mm -hmm. make this work. Well, thank you for being so understanding, and thank you for the best interview in the world. It's <laughs> actually not an interview, a conversation. A conversation. And um, I have just enjoyed being with you so much, Anne. Again, I think you're one of the truly outstanding women of the world, and you have an enormous future ahead of you, and we're all looking to you to uh, help us solve the problems you're working on, and uh, you all are great role models for all of us. So thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much, Nancy. Mm -hmm.